All right, today we're gonna to cover debt to income ratio. And I wanna go through this in detail because there are some uh, people that will throw this out and people throw out the, the term DTI or debt to income ratio all the time. Uh, but nobody stops to tell you what it is or how to calculate it. Um, it's kind of complex um, in some cases or in some loan programs of what the DTI should be and how the DTI is counted, some of the calculations here. So we're gonna break this apart and talk about this in two different sections. Number one, uh, DTI does stand for debt to income ratio. Okay, now every loan program, almost every loan program, there are two loan programs that we do that do not count debt to income ratio. Uh, but every loan program in some facet or another is going to uh, require us to calculate your debt to income ratio. Now, if it's a ratio of those two things, I am going to split this video into two discussions. Number one, we're going to talk about your debts and how they are calculated and some facets and nuances to that. And then we're going to talk about your income and how that may be calculated and how there are some nuances to that also. Okay. And I am I don't have a lot of notes. I'm writing down stuff as I'm talking. Um, I just want to cover some things in a transparent conversation between you and I. Uh, so we have just a base level understanding of what this means. Okay. Now, when we're doing a mortgage, we don't necessarily care about your total debts. For example, I use this example often, a $100,000 vehicle with a payment of $300 a month is going to hurt you less than a $30,000 vehicle at a payment of $1,200 a month. So we're looking at your monthly debts more than we're looking at your overall debts, okay? Don't, we're not gonna get into the conversation whether that should be the case or not. That's just the way it is when you do mortgages, okay? Uh, the bank is gonna look at your monthly debts, not necessarily your overall debts, okay? So when you start looking at your debts, you wanna look at the minimum payment that is required according to your credit report. Minimum payment that is required according to your credit report, okay? So if we're having a conversation and you say, hey, Major, you know, my uh, car payment is $250 a month, but I double up payments. I actually pay $500 a month. Great on you. All I care about is it's $250 per month. Okay. So, um, and this is for mortgage qualification, okay? We're not talking about when we're having a conversation about, you know, uh, budgeting and stuff like that and structuring your finances. We're only talking about mortgage qualification, okay? So you wanna take account of your minimum debts, uh, your minimum monthly payment according to your credit report, okay? Now that gets me into one other thing. People will tell me student loans. Well, Major, I don't make a payment on my student loans. They are deferred, okay? I don't make a payment on my student loans. Well, that sounds good. However, depending on your loan program, we have to account for a certain amount of calculation. I won't get into calculating how we calculate student loan payments, but regardless whether they're deferred or not, we have to account for a payment on that student loans, except for two cases, okay? If your student loans are deferred and it says that they are deferred for at least one more year, and it says that clearly on your credit report that they're deferred for at least one more year, we do not have to count for payment on that student loan, okay? The other thing, if you give us a letter from the student loan company that says that your payments are actually deferred for at least one more year, we do not have to count a payment on those student loans in your qualification. Okay, now this is not a, this is not a budget talk. This is a mortgage talk about qualifying and the things that go into it, okay? Whether you should be counting a payment, that's a whole different, you know, conversation would have you, right? So if you, if it's stated on your credit report or stated uh, by a letter from the student loan company, then we don't have to count that payment in your student loans or in your debt to income ratio when we're calculating your debts, okay? The other thing, child support or alimony, okay? If you're paying child support or alimony, those have to be counted totally in your debt to income ratio unless they are fully paid off. I do not care 
that you have only two months remaining. Well, great. That means we're not buying a house for two more months because they have to be totally paid off. Okay. Now this is really weird because when I talk about the income situation, child support and alimony accounts differently. All right. But on the debt side, if you're paying child support or alimony, that goes into your debt to income ratio. Okay. Also, if you pay child care and you're doing a student loan, I'm not talking about if you pay for private school. Okay. I'm talking about if you pay child care, daycare. Okay and you're doing a VA loan, the VA loan is the only loan that requires us to account for daycare. So if you're, uh, if you're paying for daycare for your child, we have to count that in your debt to income ratio also. Now I wanna get over into the income side. Now, when you look at your mortgage application, and when I say mortgage application, I'm not talking about the data that you submit to us, we can pile that data and then put it into something called a 1003 uh, form that's sent back to you. You sign it at some point um, in the mortgage process. When you look at that, you might see your income calculated differently than we calculated your income. All right. And this often happens for a lot of VA buyers because uh, mortgage income calculation is different than real income calculation. I'm about to prove that to you here in a second. Now, when you're doing a BAH or your housing allowance or something like that, if you're doing a VA loan, uh, that is what we call grossed up 25% because it's untaxed. If you have social security income, that is also increased 25% above what you actually make because the mortgage rules allow us to do that. And most of the times we do do that because it makes for a, a easier underwriting process. But that's uh, if you're doing a VA loan and you have BAH or something like that, housing allowance, any type of COLA or something like that. So sometimes people say, hey, my income is wrong. This is higher than my income actually is. I feel like you guys are lying on my application. Well, no, we're not doing that. We have a license, um, but we are increasing it because the mortgage rules say that we are allowed to increase it. I do want to talk about different types of income here. Now, if you are a salary employee, salary, what I call a cookie cutter buyer. Okay. Um, you're a salary employee, figuring out your monthly income is relatively quick, uh, relatively easy. It is just your gross income, whatever your salary is divided by 12. That is your monthly gross income. Okay. So you are probably the easiest type of person to calculate at least the income side. Okay. If you are an hourly employee, this gets into different types of ways to calculate your income because this can be kind of complex. If you're hourly and you work 40 hours a week, uh, but you often go over, you have overtime or something like that. Sure, you can use the 40 hours a week. Whether you can use your overtime or the amount you go over 40 hours a week has different nuances in it. This gets into how long you have done that, how long you have received that overtime, um, you probably need to talk to us in detail because you could think, hey, I'm working 60 hours a week. Um, I'm making X amount of money, but for mortgage purposes, we can only count this amount of money. So it gets into pretty complex situation now. And I'm telling you this, and I'm doing this video for you as a buyer and also for some of you realtors, I will get phone calls from the, from the realtors and, and, you know, they will tell me like, Hey major, we don't think you calculated the income correctly because she says, or he says they make this per month, but you're saying there's a, a debt to income ratio problem. I don't think you're calculating income correctly. First of all, uh, we know what we're doing. Is there a possibility that we overlook some things? Sure. But so we give some voice to that. But once we have that conversation, we need to move on because we know how to calculate the income on a buyer. Okay. You might think you made a certain amount of money. or You think you're making a certain amount of money and you're not making that, that amount of money. Another one, ooh, commission. If you are paid commissions, okay, sometimes people will change their pay structure and they'll go salary plus commission or full commission. When you make that change, um, it affects your income calculation. So if you have not uh, work commission based in general for two years, uh, that's going to affect your income calculation. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you just went full commission, okay. And you were 
commission plus salary, we can only really count the commission part of your pay. We have to drop the salary part. Or if you go full commission or you are full commission, you have to have been doing that for two years, ideally two years at the same job. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but we do want two years at the same job in order to easily calculate your commission income. It's simple to do. If you do that, you take your average income over the past two years per month, and that becomes your income. So there are some nuances to income also. Now, also, if you are self-employed, um, if you're a 1099, you get into a more complex income calculation because it's not just what you make. I have many clients that make $200,000 per year, but they write off 180. <laughs> and really for a mortgage purpose, you make $20,000 per year. Okay. So yes, $20,000 per year, although you bring in 200,000 because of the way you file your taxes. Side note here, if you plan to buy a house, make sure your CPA knows that you plan to buy a house in the next year or what have you. Um, if you're going through some type of life change, it's going to require you to buy a house make sure the person that's filing your taxes knows that um, or potentially set up a meeting between your mortgage professional and your CPA before you file your taxes just so we can have a conversation. Now, your mortgage person cannot tell you how to file your taxes or what to file on your taxes and all of that stuff. But I'm not telling you you shouldn't have a team, especially if you're self-employed. You should probably have a team of people that uh, that are advising you in certain ways, especially if you plan to buy a house. Now, if you are self-employed, I'm not telling you that you necessarily have to not write off anything. We do have programs for people who are self-employed. We can do bank statement loans and stuff like that. You need to understand that a bank statement loan um, is about one percentage point higher than normal conforming rates. OK, or one to one and a half percent. And sometimes people will ask me like, hey, should I do a bank statement loan here? Well, that's your choice. If you're going to pay 35% to the government, uh, which you will never see a return on, uh, or if you're gonna pay one and a half percent more to the bank, which you're gonna get a 1099 or 109, sorry, 1098 at the end of the year. So you can write that off against your income for, the, for that tax year. Do I think it's better to do a bank statement loan rather than not write off the things that you're entitled to write off as a business owner? Yeah, I do think that's a much better idea. That makes for much better math and much better sense. OK, so that's a program if you did happen to write off a lot of income. But if you're doing a normal conforming conventional or FHA or VA, these are some things that you need to keep in mind regarding your income. OK. There is one other type of income that we do not like, okay? It is called variable income, okay? Now, this is similar to, um, you know, if you work a lot of overtime, but this is usually if you have income that is fluctuating between uh, in amount and fluctuating in hours work. So if you are hourly worker, but you... Uh, you work 20 hours and then you work, um, you know, 30 hours then you work 50 hours and there's a lot of change in your, in your, um, in the hours that you work, you could have what we call a variable income. That income has to be averaged over two years. Or if your pay structure changed, let's say you move from job to job to job and the amount per hour change, as long as the hours work change we have to average that income over two years. So although right now you could be in a job where you're working 40 hours a week or between 30 and 40 hours a week, and you just started this job and you're just like, hey, I'm good now, I can buy a house. You probably need to talk with a mortgage professional because it is possible that you could have variable income and your income has to be averaged over the course of the past uh, 40, sorry. Your income has to be averaged over the course of the past two years and your income section could be a little bit off than what you believe your income actually is. OK, once we have those two components, we understand the debt and we understand the income, then we have to calculate what is called a debt to income ratio. It is simply debts divided by income, typical fifth grade uh, math once you have the elements of those two components. And that's going to tell us what your DTI is or debt to income ratio is. Every single loan program has a different debt to income qualification. Okay. 
I'll get later on, I'll do a video on manual underwrites if your debt to income, if the system does not like your debt to income ratio. We can uh, figure out what to do with a manual underwrite in that situation, but that's going to give us what our debt to income ratio is. Okay. Now, once you consider your debt to income ratio, it's important for you to understand that all loan programs, again, except for two, and I keep saying all because it's majority, most lenders are not going to have access to those two programs. Um, so I will tell you in general, you know, all all programs except for two programs that I currently know of have a debt to income ratio component, okay? Well, one of those programs, a DSCR, debt servicing coverage ratio loan, we do a lot of those loans. That does not have a debt to income ratio, but it's only for investment properties. Um, the other program is called a community program that one of my investors have. It's really, a, I call it a Band-Aid loan to help you figure out some stuff. It's 20% down. Um, you have to have a certain amount of reserves. It's for probably close about three or four of those a year. Um, it's only for extreme, you know, situations. So in general, all programs have a debt to income ratio component. And when we talk debt to income ratio, there's a front end debt to income ratio and a back end debt to income ratio. The front end debt to income ratio considers your housing payment only. Okay. Uh, what percentage of your income is your housing payment? The back end debt to income ratio considers your housing payment plus your debts. Okay. The housing payment plus all of your debts. So if you have a 20% front end on a, on a house that you're buying, but your debt to income ratio back end is 55% or something like that. Theoretically, could you still qualify for some loan programs? Yes. However, from a budgeting standpoint, I would be very concerned. That means you have a lot of debts, okay? If you have a front end 40%, but a back end 40%, could you qualify? For most programs, the answer is yes. Um, does that cause me concern? No, it just means that you don't have any other debts. That means that this house is going to be the most of your living. Um, and so from a, when we start from a budgeting, when we think about this from a budgeting standpoint, this only means that if you get into this house and then you start adding on a bunch of credit card debt, then you're going to basically have some, a lot of problems because this, uh, this house is a lot of your total monthly income. Okay. Another element of income that we have to consider is, uh, what I call miscellaneous or additional income. So in these categories, I put things like annuities. So if you are uh, have an annuity or monthly income from an investment that is coming in, there are guidelines on how long you have to receive that annuity. And those guidelines typically are based on the loan program that we're using. So um, in most cases, if you're receiving annuity or something like that from a uh, settlement or a, um, you know, an investment or something like that, you have to be able to receive that income for 36 months, um, in order to, uh, count that income as a count that as a part of your income that it might involve us connecting with your financial advisor, then writing a statement saying that you have to get it for 30, you're going to get it for 36 months or something like that. Although the math has to math in that situation. If you get $10,000 a month, but there's $200,000 in the account, that math is not mathing for 36 months. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. Also, I talked about this on the debt side, but I also want to cover this on the income side. Now, um, if you are receiving child support or uh, spousal support or something like that following a divorce, and you want to use that for, as part of your income to qualify for a mortgage. Um, you can do that. However, there are certain guidelines, okay, that are, are very nuanced in us counting that. I will tell you when I, I see people have challenges with many times, let's say you're receiving child support, but that child support documentation, and, and by the way, if you are receiving child support and you want to use that to qualify for a mortgage, you must, okay, you must provide us all pages of the court documentation, all of them, not just the one page that has the child support on it. I do not care. 
And sometimes people get, you know, emotional about this stuff because, you know, there's doc, there's stuff in the child support agreement that they don't want us to know or people, they're private people. And I get that you're private. I don't judge people. I really, all I want to do is make sure you get a home if you're trying to get a home. I don't care about what's in the other 75 pages of your uh, your divorce decree, right? But the underwriter is going to want all pages of the divorce decree or all pages of the child support agreement. So you must be able to receive that child support or you must be receiving that child support for 36 more months, okay? So if your uh, child is 17 years old and the the documentation does not say that that continues into college or the child support continues into college. If it stops when they turn 18, you can't use that income to qualify for a mortgage. So there's a strategic part of this. So if your child is currently you know, 15 and you want to use that income to qualify for a mortgage, the clock is ticking. OK, um, that's just the reality of the situation. So you have to be able to receive that income for 36 more months. If you're not receiving it for 36 more months, you cannot count that as a part of your uh, income qualification, which is a huge contrast from the debt side, because uh, on the debt side, if you're paying child support, if you even have one month left of child support to pay, we have to count that against your debts. Uh, but on the income side, you have to be receiving it for at least the next three years for us to count it on your income, okay? By the way, I say this, look, don't try to lie to your loan officer. You're only gonna hurt yourself. Um, first of all, if you lie to your loan officer, it's mortgage fraud. You don't wanna do that. If you lie to obtain a, to obtain a property, that's mortgage fraud. You don't wanna do that. Also, we are going to find out. Between me, your underwriter, uh, the lender, there are so many systems we have access to and the government has given us access to them as mortgage professionals so that they make sure that everything's accounted for when they give you a mortgage that's backed by the government, whether it's a, whether it's a conventional, conventional loan, even if it's a conventional loan, the government, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're going to carry that loan. So don't try to lie to your mortgage professional. We are going to find out. People tried it before and yeah, it does not work. Just tell us the truth and we'll just tell you what we can do with that truth. Okay. I'll wrap up with this. This is very important and you need to understand how I see things, especially if you choose me and my team to help you buy a home. One question I never answer is, how much home can I afford or what monthly payment can I afford? Now, sometimes people will say, hey, Major, my debt to income ratio is this. How much home can I afford? I never answer the question. The reason why I never answer the question is because I have no earthly idea because your mortgage is just one component of your life. Affordability is about your lifestyle, not about the home. So you might say, hey, Major, my debt to income ratio is 25% on this home, okay? My, the, my DTI is 25%. Can I afford that? Well, I don't know. I mean, do you go to Antigua or, you know, Mexico every other weekend? Because, you know, you have family there. Or you like to just go on vacations and you like to get away every two weeks. That's a cost that I'm not counting in your mortgage calculation. I simply don't know. Are you a homebody? Do you stay at home? Your debt to income ratio is 45% or whatever, but you're just, a, you're, you're a homebody. And this is, I mean, living in your house is your life, okay? These are things that I don't know, therefore I don't answer. Now, I will answer the question of, is your debt to income ratio in line with the average person that's buying a home? That's a statistical question, and I can answer that question any day. It, are you considered what I would call, quote unquote, normal for debt to income ratio? Sure, I'll answer that question at any time, okay? now. I understand this has been a long video, but DTI is and debt to income ratio is something we look at most often, but nobody stops and explains it to you and figure out how we come up with those numbers. And there are many elements and probably some that I forgot to include, some that I left off that, you know, engage uh, or that affect your DTI or your debt to income ratio. But this is essential in the loan qualification process, okay? I um, mean, how we count income, how we count debts, is essential for you to understand as a buyer. So um, I wanted you to understand what that process looked like. 
for us. Hopefully that gives you more insight into how this process works. Talk to you soon. See you next time on Major Money Matters.